Hi, and welcome to another episode of Tom Ray's Art Podcast. I'm Tom. On t- I get a haircut. Um, on today's show, <laughs> sorry, for people listening to just the audio, you, that doesn't make sense. On today's show, I talk to Safra, an artist that lives in Florida. We talk about her artwork, about the influences, about starting out at a high school that's actually a college, but it's also for the arts, the New World School of the Arts. Uh, I'd never heard of this place, and I wish I would have known about it when I was growing up because that would have been fun. We get into an interesting conversation about early influences, which <laughs> then leads us into a conversation about anime and Sailor Moon. And I ask, I used to watch Sailor Moon, so we have a couple of, we have a brief discussion about that. It's kind of funny. We talk about how she has been doing some print-on-demand things with her pieces and uh, recently created some book bags. Uh, you can actually get them directly from her site. They're print-on-demand. They're done by a company named Printful. Uh, one of the things that a lot of artists are doing right now is print-on-demand things to offer their artwork to people all over the world and also have more than just one painted piece. So we get into a lot of subjects. It's a fascinating conversation. And actually, it's the conversation happens in her car because there was maintenance going on in the house, so she had to go somewhere quiet. And she, we did. So when we first signed on, it's actually, I was very surprised. I'm like, you're in your car. I thought maybe she was driving at first, which would have been weird. But no, she was just finding a quiet place to do the interview. So anyway, here is my interview starting right now. Where am I talking to you from? Florida. You're in Miami, Florida? Okay. Now, yeah. how long have you been living in Miami? Since I would say high school because, I mean, I was born in Hollywood and then I spent a majority of my childhood in North Miami Beach and then I pretty much moved down here. Okay. And Hollywood, Hollywood, Florida? Yes. Okay. I only just recently learned that there's more than yeah. one Hollywood. <laughs> So, okay, so you're from you're from Hollywood, Florida and moved to there. Now, why what made you or why did you move to uh where you are now? Uh where I am now, I've pretty much been here since since high school. Like my mom's a travel agent, so oh. she would like she would usually like move in terms of like what's a better starting point for her to drive to work. But now I'm just down here with my dad since it's the pandemic and He's handicapped, so I, I do have to stay with him. Okay. And when you went to high school, uh, did did I see correctly that you went to a high school that's also a college? Uh, yeah. It's, <laughs> it's, new, um, it's new. So the arts, they're connected to Miami Day College, but there's also a college program in New World where you can pretty much continue your visual arts studies or your or performance arts and whatnot or dancing okay theater. and how did you get it so do you have to apply for something like that or is it just like an option like I, i'm i'm intrigued by this it's, so it's a performing arts high school but also a college and like how do you get into something like that i'm fascinated by this um for new world uh it's it's strictly private you definitely have to get in for your freshman or your sophomore year, but you do have to go through a whole auditioning process depending depending on what you're signing up for. Okay. I know, like I know for sure it was me and my sister that went in, but for visual arts, you have to go through a series of twenty to thirty minute drawings, depending on the style. Like we had to do still lives, self portraits, abstract or contemporary they they just wanted to see like what goes on in our heads or how far our talent is okay in terms of so what what type of stuff were you doing at this time what was your what was your art style was it similar to what you do now uh my art style at the time uh in the beginning it was more of doing fine arts and graphic design because that was that was basically what i was into Mm mm-hmm um, well, by by my senior year, like that, those were the years that they basically tell you that for your portfolio, like, well, now we have you learn everything because it was, well, museum studies, it was graphic arts, it was figure drawing and more fine arts. 
but they had us go through a lot of artist movements. So from there, in our college thesis, we had to sit there and figure out how we wanted our style to really look like. Huh. So, yeah. Wow. Because that's kind of what they ask you to do in college, and that's kind of what they were having you do in high school because they are connected to a college. It's... Yeah, I, I guess I didn't really have to figure out what I wanted to do. Well, I dropped out of high school, too. So that's, you know, I'm a different case. <laughs> but that's that's interesting. So what how did you how did you evolve into what you do now? And also, uh, I'll ask that question first. I, I was going to ask like two completely separate questions. But how did you uh, how did you find out what you wanted to do artistically during that period? Artist, artistically, like my entire life, I've well, me and my siblings watched a lot of documentaries. Okay. And most of them historical or environmental, so that just fed into a lot of anthropology and social environment. I realized once I started going into college, it's all like, oh, there's a name for it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but then, but then, like both me and my sister, my sister's in music, so she she studies a lot of. Well, a lot of classical, but mo but most of them like she likes going into operas that mm -hmm. do go into like different cultures, like across what well, like Mediterranean cultures and whatnot. Like she pretty much came off of doing Salome mm -hmm. a year before she moved up north. But for me, it was mostly. It was mostly doing figures that not that many people knew about or things about famous figures people may not have known about because through social studies I realized we were like we were like really breezing through like everything. Like mm. for Mesoamerica we basically just cover basic tribes like, like the Incas, the Aztecs and the Mayans and then I had to do more research because I realized this is all that we're going to be learning on the test and there's more tribes. Mm -hmm. Like that was, that was one of the things I realized and one of the things I really wanted to put into my portfolio, like there has to be other things that people should know about from other groups and cultures at least. Okay. So... And from that, that's so you do. I while you were saying that, I realized yes, you do a lot of. Uh, I want to say portraiture, but yeah. it's it, but they're of historical figures. Now, how how did you start um, creating likenesses? How did how would you achieve making likenesses? I, I mean, were were you doing portraits during this time? I'm, you know, like, because uh, you're doing historical figures and it's kind of based off of some of them, there aren't actual pictures and you're basing off of drawings of people or something like that. Like, how, how did you come about doing the, the portraits that you did uh, in the style that you do? Well, at first, well, at first in high school, like I, like I was really into what, like the symbolist and the surrealist style. Yeah. And like it was really colorful between what Gustav Klimt and Frida Kahlo. Mm -hmm. And at first I was interested in doing self portraits, but I really got into more of the anthropology aspect. Mm -hmm. Started doing more of that research and starting adding a lot of metallic to my to my portraitures. Yeah. But yeah, it was it was mainly from Frida Kahlo. Um, with her doing a lot of self-portraits, but in general, like that's where I got like the whole portraiture part of the portfolio. So yeah, and you're you're right. I, you do have a lot of metallic in in your stuff. How did you like? What paint are you using for this? Uh, some of the metallic look that you have. Like you said, you have um, metallic paints. Yeah, gold paint actually. L like actual <laughs> gold I paint. Okay. Yeah, because I experimented with gold leaf one time, and honestly, I don't have the patience to be sweeping up. I just... <laughs> it's like, I can do it, but I shouldn't, because uh -huh. it's... Yeah. Because I will forget, like, where to apply sometimes, so I'm like, nah, I shouldn't do this to myself anymore. Okay. How did, how did you come about uh, discovering it, uh, realizing that it was there and that you wanted to use it? Oh, well, 
like I said, I pretty much uh, looked up Gustav Klimt. And oh, yeah, that's true. I pretty much saw most of his artwork, but realized that it was gold leafing. And I'm looking at how how many different photographs I'm looking at I'm looking at of his pieces, and realized that it's probably not capturing like the full visage of the piece because it's it's metallic. Like I'm better off looking at it in real time, which I hope to do so after the pandemic, so. Right, well, you've actually been pretty busy though. You've, I guess I don't know what the timeline is. I know that you do a lot of gallery shows and you've done a lot of, you've participated in a lot of things. Um, so it, it, what are some of the things that you're doing or that you have done, like events and things like that? Well, there's this group called 10 Global. It's an, or, well, actually not a group, an organization that helps children in the Caribbean, mainly Haiti for now, mm-hmm. um, with educating them on Caribbean mythology. And oh. I did a, and I collaborated with the founder and another writer for that project. And we created a coloring book together. Really? It was, yeah, it was exclusive for that summer program, which at first I thought they may cancel it due to the band. Oh, well, yeah. I thought they would cancel it at first due to the pandemic and just do it next year, but they were still able to do it because kids were getting vaccinated. But now there's more, well, now there's more delays right now. So I'm not right. sure if if they actually finished the camp, but I know for sure the kids did get the coloring books and they were able to have that part of the program, which I'm glad for because... I saw the pictures. They looked so happy. <laughs> oh, wow. That's awesome. What was the, what was the coloring book like? Tell me about uh, how, you, how you made the coloring book. Um, well, at first it was, well, it's pretty much the Haitian spirits in mythology. And we, pr- and we basically had them like in, well, in their spirit form and then in their modern form, like how it would be translated Oh. into you know modern society so it would be something that well kids and other people can understand like mm-hmm. what they meant such as what like a farming spirit or a tree spirit or a spirit of independence or love and beauty like how that would translate into modern society as an activist or a hiker or another farmer basically oh, wow how long did they take you I would I would say it took us like a year and a half because we had to get the the group had to like come together we had to do meetings and I had to I had to spare like studio time for it because I didn't want like the kids to just have any type of illustration to fill in like I actually wanted them to like enjoy what they were coloring in mm-hmm. so there was that slight pressure like I actually did want them to have fun and not be overwhelmed by the drawing at least like I pretty much sat there looking at my thumbnails like is this too much is this too little like I I wanted them to enjoy the artwork at least yeah and so you create thumbnails before you start working sometimes okay this for this I I actually had to yeah Okay. So what is your process normally? Like say you're doing one of the paintings that you have, what what would be the process setting up uh, or uh, getting started to create one of your pieces? Well, if it's a subject that I'm familiar with, I don't take too much time to do research, but I do keep pictures laid out just Hmm. to make sure getting certain details right. Like I did do uh, recently was female Japanese female warriors, and I know there are details in their costumes that I would actually have to bring up photos for. Hmm. But other than that, I was trying to keep it somewhat original. Okay. But with with others, with others such as when I was drawing pharaohs, like that one, that required less because I've been watching documentaries and stuff like that for a while there's also um the backgrounds that you do the the you don't just do a portrait there's there's always like um 
a very elaborate background. Like what's some of the inspiration and, and the uh, concepts behind the stuff that's going on behind the person? Oh, those are symbols. Oh, like, they are. Most okay. of them are, most of them are symbols that pertain to, that pertain to the actual figure or to the culture they belong to. Like for, like for example, the, well, the Pharaoh painting that I was doing of Nefertiti and Tai, mm -hmm. um, pretty much playing a board game that was pretty, actually it's still, it's still around. Uh, it's called Senate and it kind it kind of looks like a chessboard and Matt Gammon and Matt Gammon at the same time. Mm -hmm. it's, an, it's another, but it, but in the background, there's blue lotuses, there's the Eye of Ra, and other florals in there that many of the nobles in ancient Egypt would either what consume for medicinal purposes or for euphoric purposes or therapeutic purposes and whatnot. So it's, it's pretty much objects or symbols that pertain to the portraits. Okay. When, when you, uh, when you actually contact people to put your stuff in galleries, cause you've been, you've been in galleries and been in uh, different events. Um, how, how do you describe your work? Like, I know there has to be kind of like a, a bio, but there's also kind of, uh, you know, an elevator pitch or, you know, like a, a synopsis. Like, how do you, how do you describe what you do? Cause I know you've got, you've got paintings, you've got uh, sculpture, uh, pop culture art. You've, you've, uh, mentioned like, how do you describe all of what you do to people when you're trying to reach out to a gallery? Um, I would have to say whatever specifically being asked because oh. I mean, I, I do get asked sometimes, uh, what was the, what was the inspiration? Why this figure? Are you doing it for, are you doing it for this and that? Like I, like I do actually have summaries of, well, the background of these portraits, like which civilization they're from or what figure they're representing or what's the symbols in the background and such and such and what materials I used and why I use specific colors and palettes or why I focused on a singular color. Um, it's, it's questions I get like that hmm. that I wouldn't have. Would you say that you're a painter? Because I know you started out, uh, you've done graphic design as well, too. So how would you describe? And and it's horrible to go like, uh, are you a painter or are you a graphic designer or whatever? But what would you say your your <laughs> your type of art name would be? I, I guess I'm trying to think of like what. Um, oh, like my art style. Yeah. Altogether. I mean, so I mean, so far I did check with a marketer last year just to reevaluate that okay. once upon a time, and he pretty much said it was along the lines of pop art. But the more I actually got into my portfolio and into my current style, it's I realize it's more expressive expressionism. Oh yeah, because most of my inspiration came off of it came off of Gustav Klimt. Uh, Frida Kahlo, and I mean, I did have a high school friend who painted like really similarly. Really? Who, who did things like that. And I know at first, like during high school, I, I wasn't really into the whole mosaic style and dabbing until like I saw her do it. Um, her name is Gabriela Guzman. She was, one, she was one of my classmates. And I'm not going to lie, I really loved her painting style, so... So a bit of that actually went into my paintings. I have a very similar story with a friend of mine, but we're still friends too. But it was one of those things where like we were friends and then he'd do something and I'd be like, ah, that's, I was going to do that. <laughs> yeah. So how would you, uh, that made me forget what I was going to ask next. Oh yeah. I wanted to ask <laughs> Um, and the place where you work at a place that I'm very intrigued by, uh, the studio that you have is called zero spaces or zero empty uh, spaces, zero empty spaces. Yes. Um, it's with Evan snow and, um, Mr. Martineau, Mr. Montanau, Mr. Martineau. I'm going to say that, um, they're pretty much into real estate Okay. Yeah. and, and they buy out empty or unused retail spaces in order to convert them into artist spaces really so 
artists can come in by a certain corner or or square footage of the space. Like sometimes it would be like 72 or 96 or even more than 250 square foot, and you and the artists would have to pay or rent um, every well rent every month because there's no real contract. Like okay. they can just stop paying and move on to another space. Um, it's two dollars per square footage, and Ooh. which is a really good deal. Yeah, because mine is like 132, and it's like under 300 for wow. rent every month. How did you How did you find that place? I was more introduced to this like when we were having a potluck over in ArtServe in Broward. Okay. And Snow started talking about it, and he had business cards and a whole website set up. And on the website, you can pretty much say where you where you're located and where you would and where you would want to be notified. Because well, I live in Miami, and well, the nearest um, space that they have for me in this area that I'm in is in Gulfstream or Hollywood. But the Hollywood location is closed, so I'm in Gulfstream okay. or moving to Gulf. That's yeah. It was I was fast. I thought that's what it might be. It, it looked like that when I saw the website, and they have different yeah. They have the different spots all over the place, and I wanted to check because it's it was it just because I saw that you had that on your website, and uh, I, I was intrigued by that. And and it just per- personally, it looked really cool. <laughs> so I was I, I kind of wanted to know more about it. Oh, that's and you did an auction recently too, didn't you? Oh yeah, and for Wilton Art, uh, it it pretty much was a a mini organization that was set up in in the city hall for well in Wilton, and it I mean it was more to contribute to the to the arts program that they pretty much had for Wilton, Florida. So so it was actually it was a really nice auction because like before before they basically started small and then they started getting they started getting more recipients especially internationally oh really so so yeah like it it was more of contributing to the arts in broward for that area and it was it was super successful and it was it was really exciting because it was artists that were pretty much coming over from all over that were dropping off pieces okay it, were you so were you there personally for the because it was a live auction right um uh, unfortunately not for this year because okay. i mean the first time they did they did do it in person but because of the pandemic like it was one of those events like most events like they couldn't have it in person yeah. So they didn't. So all these beautiful artwork being set up, like in the city hall, but no one can actually have like a real get together and see all of them. Right. And purchase them in real time. So there was that. Yeah. It was still a good experience. I mean, the team was really the team was really nice, professional, and and the artists were the artists were great. Like it was, it was a nice experience, at least for the intake portion of it. Yeah, no, the expression on your face shows that you were really, you were really happy with it. You, you, you look like you're thinking back on it as you're telling me about it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the intake was great, and that that just made that just made me wish like this was like a whole real time event. Mm-hmm. And but what, it all happened virtually instead. So. Yeah. Well, what is it like to? sit there and watch something you worked on actually live be auctioned live, like actually being bid on. That's, that's, that's gotta be fascinating. Fascinating. When you're watching the page refresh every few seconds. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, no, it's, it it looked like I I was looking at all the stuff on there. It's, it's, it looked like it, there was a lot of really cool stuff and uh, yeah. And it looked like yours, it looked like yours did well. Uh, from what I saw, <laughs> it did like mo- like like the percentage of the percentage of the auction like goes into donation for the arts program for Broward, and then the rest goes to the artist. And for events like this, like, are you contacting people or are they contacting you? Like, how are you finding these events and things that you get involved with? In I mean, 
you're in different areas. You're doing online stuff. You're doing galleries. Uh, how do you get in touch with the people who do these? Um, I do. Well, I do get into contact with artists that are already like on social media or oh. if I met the show before. But so far, right now, it's mostly social media or me posting up stuff and commenting and messaging. So back then, I was more personally involved by going into art exhibits, but now it's now it's back to the introvert room where I just <laughs> where I talk to everyone from my laptop. Yeah, well, there's nothing wrong with that. It's actually it's a wider reach. It's just I guess it's more of an isolated outreach because you I don't know you can't just walk up to someone. You got to try and find them, and then you got to wait for them to respond back. <laughs> So, but, um, and how do you, so when you're doing that, I mean, is it just searching other accounts? Uh, like how are you finding even the people that you reach out to online or on social media? I, I mean, so far my process has been people I've already met at art exhibits oh, or, okay. or what Martin or what marketers from organizations I already follow, like recommend, like so far that has been my strategy and it's, it's been working well so far, mm -hmm. but other times I do look at other styles and see if I can connect. Like it's, it's mostly been that strategy. Okay. And you did mention sort of before that you talked to a marketing person recently. So it, is that part of the new thing that you're trying out too? Um, not new. I mean, this was pre pandemic. That okay. I, that I did the few meetings an art serve with the marketing team and they basically like gave and they basically gave me notes and a heads up of what to do in terms of networking it's it's mainly i had to clarify like what my portfolio does it's all like i know what i wanted to do but it's a matter of like clearly explaining like what pieces that you can really talk about mm. versus the ones that you enjoyed, but you can't really actually put it into words why you enjoy loving it. So <laughs> no, the, the, exactly. <laughs> it's the hardest thing. And then you don't want to go. It's like this and this because, you know, like it, it, the dreaded, you know, comparing it to other art styles sort of thing, which makes it very easy for people. But at the same time, it's like, but it's not really that it sort of is. <laughs> <laughs> yes. What would you say are some of your earliest influences? Like when you first started getting into art before high school, before getting like, what would you say? It, I always find this interesting when I ask people this, uh, like the first thing that you started drawing, the first thing where you were like, oh, I like doing this. Ooh, all right, let's get into that. <laughs> so, okay. So I know beforehand in middle school and I tried not to let this influence me all the way because middle school I was doing a lot of fine arts, like still lives, figures, we were doing plants. And the thing is, is that I was mostly, still am, into anime. Nice. <laughs> so, a lot of my male classmates were watching or playing games on. That was getting really exciting for me because I was getting off of a lot of effeminate things and such like uh sailor moon so right there, so there was that and i still had to do still lives figures and try not to get too cartoony right oh my god yeah i finally had to accept being cartoony i was just like all right i'm a cartoonist heck with it <laughs> No, but I definitely, I definitely did get into the illustrative part of it. So that part did get into like my my final illustrative type of style that I was starting to develop at the time. Because mm -hmm. I knew for sure in terms of in terms of like graphic design or graphic arts, I wanted to get into web comics but i wanted them to be fully illustrated too mm -hmm. did you get into web comics i didn't see anything of you doing web comics it is it's not actually things that i post up it okay was, but it was a lot of sketching i did that right. i never actually put online 
except for my deviant art that was that was basically the one account that I had like everything on okay but, but everything else was my expressionist ones my fine arts ones and like anything that was anything that was more anime or fan art it was either between tumblr or deviant art because i still have those accounts okay would you uh <laughs> i want to ask you so much about the webcomic but you said you don't post it so i don't want to pry <laughs> i want to be like what was the subject matter on it could i ask that at least could you give me a basic synopsis of of what the webcomic was like Yeah, there's the other thing. It was my <laughs> concept that I was trying to perfect since middle school, but even then, like, I had to focus more on my art style and try not to let the whole thing overlap. And as I said, because I watched Sailor Moon, like, I <laughs> I was into a lot of action magical girl things. Okay. So, so I pretty much came up with this whole concept called Rebel Project. <laughs> Oh, okay. And, and instead of the main lead, like, having pink, she she had rainbow colors on her. And she had, what, like, six other teammates. And I think the first concept I had was called Rainbow Soldiers. Nice. I love that. <laughs> I mean, the, I, the story was pretty basic. Just seven, Just seven chosen girls... They turn to magical girls and they save the world from evil. It was it was that basic thing. Yeah. But I mean, over time, I try to see if I can make twists and turns on it. But after a while, like I still had to focus on building my portfolio. So right. it was it was basically an on and off thing. But now that there's the pandemic, I'm like, I really need to go back into this thing. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, my son and I were actually fans of Sailor Moon too. Um, I never understood the tuxedo guy. I never understood what what he brought to the table. Tuxedo mask. Um, <laughs> okay, because I'm a, I'm still a fangirl of Sailor Moon because there are just several different incarnations. The whole point of te of tuxedo of tuxedo mask was that um, he's actually the reincarnated. Well, now this is going into the story. Uh, he's the re he's the reincarnation of Prince Endymion, that was Princess um. Serenity's lover back in the Silver Millennium, in the story, which Princess Serenity is now Sailor Moon. But the thing is, is that he comes in to her aid whenever you know she's cornered and whatnot. But the thing is, in the original comic, he actually has more abilities. Like in the show, he only throws roses or appears and disappears. That's what I meant. But, it was it was just like he he seems useless, kind of. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. The thing is, is that in the original comics, he he can actually throw like bombs, like different kind of bombs, like okay. smoke bombs, actual explosives, and he and he can actually teleport. And because and because he is technically Sailor Earth, <laughs> right? He is he is connected to the earth psych well through to well through telepathy and psychosis so and so whenever there's a new enemy that shows up he would know first so he he was actually more interesting in the manga well the manga that's that's pretty much what the original comic was right called. yeah but but for but for the actual anime adaptation, uh, the director at the time was not at all interested in developing his character, as it as it turned out. So, so Directors. he was very under. <laughs> so, I know. All right. Actually, that clears it up for me. I think a lot of it had to do with uh, when my son and I were watching it. It was like we we never really knew which episode we were getting. We would catch it. But like, I feel like there were gaps in the story. And I'm like, am I missing something here? And so that that actually clears up a lot. That's that's like 10, 20 years in the in the making. You explaining that for me. So that helps. Thank you. <laughs> All right. The thing is that you probably watched the English dub. You I did. definitely have original dub because oh. the English had a lot of stuff cut out 
Like that was that was another issue that That's me true. and people in the fandom pointed out. Like a lot of a lot of English translations will have stuff lost in translation. Yeah. That that actually makes a lot of sense. Funny. All right, all right. Now back to your art. So <laughs> now um, I I know that you have a, a shop online, and with um, things changing and a lot of people experience, experiencing a surge in online stuff, um, you've done uh, you you have a shop. You sell prints. You sell your original artwork through your shop, and you do commissions. Um, how has that been? Like, has it have you seen an uptick in that? Has um, is that something you're trying to focus more on? Like, how's the experience been actually selling things online through your site? Uh, selling things online have actually been truly simple because it's mm. it's it's pretty much a third party manufacturing that's happening. Okay. Because because a lot of the deliveries are happening from Printify. Oh, I was going to ask if you were using I, Printify. But I know for sure I. I would rather like order the things myself and package them myself. Like the sales part hasn't been difficult. It's a matter of like, I would rather package them and send them off myself. So I know for sure I eventually want to get to that point, but like for now, um, a lot of the packaging would have to be up to them because Mm -hmm. there's also me going out and getting art supplies and paying for my studio rent. So I can't, really do everything like even though even though I do have like the whole strategy in my head I like I know there's things I can't do because my hands are tied in those situations so there's that yeah no it would be nice like uh the the main thing with Printify like you could buy them and get them sent to you but you they only Mm -hmm. have like a few samples you can get at cost you can't like buy in bulk at cost you have to buy you basically have to buy at full cost and then you have to hold on to it. Like you could get it shipped to you. Like I know that uh, like with uh, Amazon, if you create Amazon books and they print the books for you, you can buy author copies. So you can get them at like the actual discounted price. I wish Printify would do such a thing because I totally agree with you. It's really nice that it's print on demand and they do it for you. But it's like it also print on demand means like it might be printed in a week and then sent. You know, you might be able to send it quicker and the packaging. You're absolutely right. And I wish I do wish there was a way that 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 could be done. They have a whole base of things that they already have to print on and whatnot. I don't don't think they have to do boxes, too. I wish and maybe they're not at that point yet, but it's it's still a good it's still a good venture. Yeah. And and they do have the uh, the warehouse. is a little expensive, but you do have the option to go like you send them the product and it sits in the warehouse and it can already be pre-boxed and they'll ship that for you. But at that point it's like, well then why don't I ship it myself? (laughs) Um, But, but you have been, so you, that has been doing okay for you. I would say, okay. Like, like pretty much tolerable because there are fees you have to pay in order to get printed out and then sent out and then you have to confirm them. And oof, just to make sure, because I mean, I'll be honest, I've had a few mishaps where oh. people accidentally like sent to another address and they're all like, can I cancel that order? I'm all like, sure, because I have about 12 more hours <laughs> for, <laughs> before this thing says, yep, OK, we're ready to ship and create. I'm like, oh, it's too late. <laughs> <laughs> But other than that, like I, I never want my customers to have that weird experience where it's too late and they can't ship anything back. Like I do make those kind of requests and try to, and try to get them back. And if it doesn't for like a certain number of days, like I do, re- I do like request for a refund, so so the customer gets their money back because I know for sure between. Between me and other artists, like, we don't want to give people that kind of problem. It's like, you don't want that for yourself, so right. so don't be that type of LLC. Right. And how do you, uh, with the paintings, how do you get the actual, like, how do you take the, are you scanning it or are you photographing it? Like, how are you getting the print so that it's, it's a good copy of it? Uh, well, in terms of putting on the website, that's, that's pretty much for Printify, but... 
I I usually photograph most of my pieces anyway. Okay. Like so you are photographing my, them? Yeah. Okay. Because I, I spoke to an artist recently who uh, he scans a lot of his stuff, but also he likes to take those scans of his paintings that he does and because he's got a he's got one of the big scanners, you know, so it's easy for him. But he likes to take those scans and then cut up pieces of it to use as collage art later on, like with the textures and everything. And he'll put those pieces together in like a software program, which I found fascinating. And he does some pretty neat stuff with it. So I was curious if you if you ever had uh, uh, like a back or a scanned catalog of the stuff that you do or if it's photographs. I mean, I suppose you could do it with photographs, too. I don't know why scanning would make the difference. I just realized I had an inner dialogue with myself just then. <laughs> no, it definitely depends on on the piece itself, like what lighting it would look good under, because I I use a lot of daylight lighting for my pieces, because that's that's the best quality lighting for the colors to come out mm -hmm. in the way that they do, and also point out like if there's metallic stuff, if there's metallic paints in there too, like those are the best lighting to actually point that out. Because if I, if I tried to use ambient lighting and then take a photo, it would be difficult to Photoshop to brighten up or to darken some areas because the color will come out all wrong. Even if I do edit saturation, mm -hmm. it's, it comes out pretty chaotic. So, so it's mainly you have to make sure you have to have the right lighting first before initially taking a picture because it's... It's not just like the quality of the picture. It's it's basically how you want the colors to come out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it makes. And I agree with you on the the daylight too. I've done some stuff with, and, and also usually I didn't realize till I started taking pictures of things um, how much yellow there is in a lot of normal lights. Like I'll, I'll take yeah. a, it, it's amazing and, until I started paying attention. I've I've never noticed that. And now it's like, why is everything orange? You know, it's. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, um, and then uh, it, it, what are what are some things that you have coming up or some uh, opportunities that you have in the near future that uh, people should know about? In the near future, um, I did receive or was told that I was to receive a proclamation from the vice mayor of North Miami Beach. Um, that Get was out. supposed to be. That was supposed to be happening um, last month, but she told me that her advisory team was telling her that she was having way too many cultural events because there was one week in June where she was just having like back-to-back -back, like cultural lunches. Uh, she had one for so she had one <laughs> <laughs> she had one for Asian heritage and Jewish heritage, and then she had this whole block party for. Haitian Heritage Month and her advisory team was like okay that's way too many parties time out <laughs> so okay I, I suppose yes it is it is a lot of parties yeah. it's like okay do, do <laughs> let's do some governmental stuff but no she she is very politically involved it's just that most of these events was to basically it, pretty much to bring the community together and even the Haitian cultural block party she had like it it brought out like the entire neighborhood. There was still masks. There was still, there were still restrictions. But like everyone came outside. Everyone had a great time. Mm -hmm. Like everyone had picnics. Like it was, it was a nice event. But the thing is, it was going like from early in the afternoon and into late at night. And that was that was the event that we were supposed to have the proclamation sent out to people in the committee and people who are involved in the community. And um, because they also had speeches, it was going for a while. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, me and a few more people who were supposed to be presented for those proclamations, like, we didn't get a chance to either receive it or give a whole speech about it. So we have to wait for another event. Like, she didn't, like, openly let people know that yeah, this is how, it's like, yeah, we're missing out on some people. Like, they didn't want to make it look like that in the middle of the event, so. <laughs> okay. So now, so now, like, that's going to be for a private dinner or another event somewhere in the month. So that is being held off for now and until I get 
told when we're going to have like a new proclamation event. Okay. All right. And then any other gallery shows coming up or anything like that? Gallery shows. Um, Zero Empty Spaces is actually having uh, an event. It's either going to be on the yes, it's going to be on the eleventh. I'm going to post it up on my website actually. Okay. So I'm the right date. But it is a show, um, an exhibit called Reflection of Me, and it's basically works that you're close to or that actually reflects either your style or the artist themselves and you do explain like what about what about you like is highlighted in the piece and i i pretty much chose one that i used in a previous show in art sir that was related to like what makes you feel most at home because that one was more self portrait based in theme but it's it's a huge Asian dragon. <laughs> <laughs> and speaking of your website, where should people go to check out your work and the stuff that you do? Safra Art, well, safra-art.com. That's T-Z-I-P-O-R-A-Art.com. And I want to thank you so much for meeting with me today. I'm so glad that we got a chance to talk. Thank you.